We watched another episode of this show before, but it's time to check out another episode of Body Bazaar. Let's get started. Be woo! 56-year-old fisherman and father of two, Alejandro Ramos, goes by the name Willie. Four years ago, Willie suffered a horrifying accident that mysteriously transformed his body. I kept swelling. My arms grew to an incredible size. It didn't go down. He almost has the phenotype, the body type of someone who who injects synthol, which is uh, an artificial oil it made to enlarge your muscles. But it's almost like not in his muscles. I was working at a depth of around 115 feet. A cargo ship was coming. It went over my air hose and cut my air hose in two. I knew I had to surface fast. I couldn't stay any longer. I let go of my lead belt and got pushed up like a bullet. I started to lose all of my senses. I opened my eyes, everything was blurry. So the neurologic findings that he's experiencing is basically a diver's disease or bends, where basically uh, nitrogen bubbles, part of the inert gases that you inhale every time you take a breath, start bubbling up. If you inhale those gases at a depth of 100 feet, those gases are inhaled at a higher pressure. Therefore, when you go into a lower pressure environment, those gases start bubbling up. And imagine your blood starting to bubble, it causes serious problems, usually in the neurologic system and your joints. Willie's chest and arms ballooned, leaving his torso swollen and deformed. This is a very, very severe form of it. Like, usually it's mild, and usually it is treatable with 100% oxygen treatment, usually in a hyperbaric chamber. Using a hyperbaric chamber, doctors treat sufferers by having them breathe oxygen in this pressurized vessel. I've seen patients who've had subaquatic illnesses and arrived completely swollen, but with the hyperbaric chamber, these have disappeared in one to three hours. Yeah, so he must have had more severe damage to his blood vessels as a result of that swelling where it seems to have become permanent. And you know, uh, when you damage blood vessels and they become more permeable, uh, they could start to leak. When those blood vessels start to leak, it could actually create edema in the uh, surrounding structures, which is what he could be having. It's a very similar to what happens when you have age-related, gravity-related swelling in your lower extremities, in your legs. So like you stand all day, you're age 60, your veins aren't as spry anymore, so they're a little bit more swollen. Blood starts to pool there throughout the day. And as a result, they become more permeable, more edema comes out. And as a result, you have thicker ankles at the end of a long day, which is why we recommend to pick your ankles up, to wear supportive compression stockings, et cetera, et cetera. Willie has had multiple sessions in a hyperbaric chamber. Sadly, he has not returned to his normal size. As a result, Dr. Aguado decided to draw blood and take tissue samples from Willie to solve the mystery. I wonder what part of the body he's actually taking samples from. Is it from the blood vessel, the muscle, the adipose fat tissue? A month later, Dr. Aguado confirms that Willie's condition was due to nitrogen being lodged in his fatty tissue. The next medical step will be reconstructive and cosmetic surgery to remove the fatty deposits. How in the world do they need that test in order to say like, oh, get cosmetic surgery and we'll fix it? I'm pretty sure that would have been anyone's recommendation whether or not they knew it was from the nitrogen bubbles. Yuliana was born with congenital melanocytic nevus, a rare genetic skin condition that causes an overproduction of skin pigmentation cells. And it not only produces melanin a lot, it produces melanin a lot in specific areas. So as you can tell, it's not her entire skin color, it's just sporadic. Her birthmarks and dark patches of skin also made Yuliana sad and self-conscious. That's very understandable. If you're born um, and you look different than everyone else around you, especially as a child, it's easy to get bullied and then feel uh, like you're ostracized from your own peers. Some parents say, can you take your child from our children? We don't want them to get sick. This is not a, a contagious illness, first of all. And second of all, how ironic is it that we have individuals who have, let's say, clear skin without a birthmarks on it, who want to get tattoos to put dark pigment into their skin. And then we have individuals who have a lot of pigment in their skin who are self-conscious of it and want to get rid of it. It's interesting how the grass is always greener analogy applies in situations like this. Yuliana now posts photos of herself on social media to promote awareness of the issues faced by people with skin conditions. I think that's great uh, in order to highlight 
that humans come in all different shapes, sizes, colors. And just because her appearance outwardly looks different, it shouldn't stop her from living a full life. And it shouldn't stop you from interacting with someone like this. One out of 10 people with congenital melanocytic nevus will develop skin cancer. So basically, when you have um, a type of birthmark pop up like that, uh, essentially you're having micro mutations in those areas because you're having excess production. When you're having excess production, that puts you at higher risk for cancerous production. If I will stay at the sun for a long time, every of my small birthmarks also can change to melanoma and it's really risk. So that's why I need to go and check them. The way that we check them is through a classification system known as A, B, C, D, E. Each one represents a specific criteria that we look at. A, asymmetry, B, the borders, C, the color, D, the depth, and E is evolving. Basically how it changes over time. That's why if you ever have a mole or, or birthmark that has changed, that's a good reason for you to go see the doctor. And this allows us to understand uh, what risk each of those uh, birthmarks poses to the individual. If some of them are suspicious, we do send them through a biopsy to pathology to figure out if they're cancerous. Dr. Witowski uses cutting edge digital dermoscopy equipment to photograph all of Yuliana's birthmarks, capturing their exact positions and sizes so they can be monitored for any changes. In her condition, it's a lot harder to gauge changes because there are so many of these birthmarks. And also like, look, if I have two small birthmarks on my legs and one of them happens to change and we're concerned, we can easily take that small biopsy. But imagine she has many of them. If she can't like biopsy her entire skin layer, so for her, it's best to do this through a non-invasive method and be strict with it like a camera. This lesion is the only one on your body, but it is different from the rest, and it's a good idea to remove the lesion just for your own safety, and then we'll assess it with histopathology. So histopathology, they'll basically take a slice of it, look it under a microscope, and then if they do in fact see a cancer, you might have to go for excision with wider margins. When we say things like margins, what we're actually saying is that we wanna make sure that at the borders of the area that you've biopsied, there is no residual cancer, which means that you got the entire cancer. Back to the show in just a second, but first, First, I wanna to talk to you about PayPal Honey, the number one shopping tool in America. Here's how it works. You know how when you watch a YouTube video or listen to a podcast, and maybe catch wind of a promo code for a website selling products you really love? But there are millions of YouTube videos and podcasts including my own, and you can't possibly be expected to scour the internet for all those codes every single day. That's where Honey steps in. You see, Honey automatically searches for promo codes so you don't have to. Simply shop the items you want, and then when it's time to check out, let Honey see what promo codes they can scrounge up for you. It works on websites where you already shop for products you already buy, like shoes, video games, food delivery, yum. I'm constantly ordering stuff online, and with Honey, that process has never been cheaper and easier. The best Best part, it's free. Add Honey to your browser now by visiting joinhoney.com slash Dr. Mike. Remember, doctor is spelled out to start saving on those orders. All right, let's get back to the show. Jolison's astonishing height of seven foot nine makes him the tallest man in Brazil. Oh, wow. Three years ago, Jolison met Eva. They weren't exactly a perfect match. Eva is just five feet tall. Maybe that is a perfect match. Perfect match doesn't mean they have to be the same height. But there was an instant attraction. I'm instantly attracted to that little goat thing that they have. Is that a goat or a puppy? And the two were married oh. within a year. I love that the cake decor is true to size, at least true to proportion. The couple is concerned that Jolison's fertility has been affected by his condition. It's important to note that before we start working people up for infertility, we do give a substantial amount of time to try and conceive. And sometimes that's a year or, or even longer. Gigantism is caused by a tumor in the pituitary gland the part of the brain that controls hormones. By the time he was 21, Jolison had a range of other health problems. He decided to have surgery to try to prevent the tumor from causing further problems as he got older. I'm pretty sure Tony Robbins has the same tumor and was recommended by doctors to remove said tumor and decline because he enjoyed the advantage that it gave him. And I'm not his doctor, but I saw an interview with him saying this directly. Jolison will need to provide a sample of his semen. Basically, they're trying to look at the number of sperm cells. They're trying to look at the sperm motility, as well as other factors to check if issues with fertility stem from something within his sex cells, or is it his partner's? Your spermogram test doesn't show the presence of sperm. 
The excessive amount of hormones that triggers gigantism can lead to a reduction in other hormones, such as testosterone. This has led to Jolison having underdeveloped testicles. This should have also been uh, elucidated on the physical exam. That should have been part of all of this workup. I'm surprised that it took them finding this out on a test as opposed to a physical exam. And I wonder if this condition would be correctable by giving him hormone supplementation. The couple is now making plans to move forward with adoption mm -hmm. to complete their family. Oh, that's not a goat. That's a puppy the whole time. It looked kind of goaty to me. On the outskirts of the city, there's a boy living with a unique condition, 11-year-old Lee Hang. Lee Hang now weighs more than 300 pounds. He suffers from a rare genetic disorder called prader villi mm, syndrome. Prader you know, this is interesting because this condition is not something I've ever seen in my patients, but it is something that is frequently tested in medical school and on medical boards. Uh, where it's a congenital syndrome, where it's a chromosomal issue. More specifically, it not only affects hunger, but also uh, cognitive impairments, sleep impairments, many other factors uh, in the development uh, throughout a child's life. There's no known cure for prader villi syndrome, which can also cause a number of physical, mental, and behavioral problems. His large size would put him at higher risk for development of early onset even uh, osteoarthritis, joint disease. In a desperate attempt to help him lose weight, Li Hang's parents are taking him to a hospital that practices traditional Chinese medicine designed to help people battling obesity. He has a disorder in the feeding and satiety centers in the hypothalamus located in the brain. This is true, but it, it's a genetic issue so it's at the core of his cells. The medical treatments here are unorthodox, but doctors are licensed medical specialists, and the hospital claims a high rate of success. We will use traditional acupuncture, fire therapy, and fire cupping. This is where I kind of start getting disconnected from the adjunctive therapies like acupuncture, where we're talking about it for musculoskeletal uses, for pain uses, where there seemed to be some evidence, and then we start moving it to just general well-being or obscure cases like this, where you're saying that needles can impact the neurological structure and the genetic structure of someone's brain. That seems to be a little bit too far out for me to say that it matches some level of evidence-based medicine. Fire therapy with Chinese medicine is where we incorporate extracts of herbal medicine that help speed up metabolism. We light up the medicine with fire. It is especially helpful for patients with abdominal obesity. Finally, Li Hang is given a round of fire cupping treatment. I don't even know what that fire therapy is. I'm not gonna lie. It, it seems very non-evidence-based. And again, cupping, uh, in general has very weak evidence for it, but then for myofascial tightness, for restrictions, again, musculoskeletal conditions, I could see it being valuable. But for someone who has a hunger issue from a genetic condition, it seems a little ridiculous to treat it with this. But the doctor points out that these traditional remedies can only work if Li Hang is able to stop his excessive eating. If he stops his excessive eating, he will lose weight without those treatments. Like that's the core of the situation. So I find it ridiculous that they're saying that. There's no foolproof scientific evidence these procedures are effective. This is where patients um, in situations like this are often misled because they're just searching for any type of cure. Where science doesn't have an answer, pseudoscience and misinformation tends to thrive. Mark may appear healthy, but he actually suffers from one of the world's rarest disorders. Why is he looking at the waters so angrily? I'm sure it has something to do with water. I have to drink 20 liters water a day to stay alive. I can last without water one and a half up to two hours. I wonder if this is a form of diabetes insipidus where he actually is either lacking or not responding to a specific hormone that prevents fluid loss, excessive fluid loss through your urine. This is actually an important hormone that your pituitary gland stores and your hypothalamus creates in order for you to be able to balance the amount of water in your system. And that's a very tightly controlled balance. I um, will get very high fever and dizziness. Can't, can't remember things and I do not know in um, extreme where I am and who I am. It essentially becomes a, a form of dehydration. Mark suffers from the rare disorder known as renal diabetes insipidus or nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. 
the difference between that and like the cranial version of it is that the cranial version is your body doesn't produce the hormone and in renal or nephrogenic is uh, for some reason it's not responsive to the hormone. I wake up in the night and um, then I go to the toilet and go back and sleep again. So you can can say, okay, maybe it's 20 times a day. It's important that we point out this has nothing to do with diabetes mellitus, which is a sugar control condition, whereas this is a water retention excretion condition or water balance condition. Mark's condition is very interesting. It's a very rare condition. Unfortunately, we do not have a very good treatment for those patients, not to say 